I hope you can hear me. Yes. Good evening, everyone. The Society of Naval Architecture Students, NAS, is the student's body by the students of the Department of Ship Technology. We have joined together to witness the first episode of a series of webinars in association with those stars related to naval architecture and shipbuilding. For the first episode, we have Mr. Sujit Tuneri, who is the senior surveyor and team leader at Lloyd Lloyd's Register of Shipping. He is the alumni of 26th batch Department of Ship Technology. He has completed his master's degree from Newcastle University in 2015. He has also 15 years of experience in marine and offshore segment, of which about 13 and a half are with Lloyd's Registers of Shipping. Currently leading the hull structural design appraisal segment within the areas of operations such as South Asia, Middle East, and Africa, and also leading the polar and ice class aspects within this region. Now, it's my deep honor to invite Mr. Sujit Tuneri to lead us with the webinar on this topic, Special Service Craft Success Application of Lloyd Register, Lloyd Register Rules. Please, sir. Hello, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible. Please. Yeah. Okay, what I'll do is that I'll sh start sharing my screen. Yes, sir. So is it visible? Yes, sir, it's visible. If it is visible, Sujit Nari. Yep. So please let me know when ready to start. So almost all of the participants have joined right now. So uh, you can please start right now. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Mohammed, for giving a brief introduction about myself. That saves quite a lot of time. So the basic idea of uh, today's session is to brief about special service craft structure, application of LR rules. So at this session, I've been, I've been structured in such a way that uh, this is basically a two to three hours uh, training courses I used to deliver. So what I did is that um, since it is only one hour time, I customized uh, based on the time frame, and I didn't really run through it. So whether please pardon me if um, if it is slightly dragging than the expected time, but I'll try my best to limit within the time frame allocated. So these are the agendas for today's session. So basically, I will start with giving a introduction of LR and LR rules and followed by do a simple case study on how to select the correct rules for the particular ships and its operational profile. And upon knowing about the rules, I'll straight away go to the core topic, SSC structure design by going through the process map from start to end. And upon completing that, we'll go, we will look into the various class notation available and we'll spread through it and we'll explain the significance of each class notations. And after that, 
we'll glance through the software uh, software means it is not going to be a training session uh, basically the, the whole training is usually covered in one day program so what i'm going to do is that um, i will make sure that you will get an idea of what that software is so we'll glance through one of the already completed projects and we'll explain uh, quickly on what what is the capability and how it is done so whoever using this software in the future will get a fair idea of how to use it so i'll make sure that and we'll conclude by doing a q a in the final one so that's how it has been uh, structured so let's go through the slide lloyd's register and its role lloyd's register the journey started from the coffee house to post modernist building lr owe the foundation uh, owe the name and foundation to a 17th century coffee house owned by edward lloyd LR was founded in London in 1760 to examine merchant ships and classify them according to their condition. A small team of surveyors, mainly being retired captains of sea, uh, captains of the ship, was employed to examine vessels and classify them according to their conditions, and hence the classification society. The early register contained details of the vessels, owner, master, tonnage, date of build. and um, number of guns you might be wondering why it is number of guns in those days there were quite a lot of pirates issue so uh, it is to be recorded in the register book how many guns were carried and also the condition of the hull and equipment and um, hence this uh, classification society name came so basically they classify the ship based on the conditions of hull and equipment you can see one uh, ship in the right hand uh, left hand side of there's a gray color the sirius built in 1837 was the first iron vessel to be classed by lr and first appears to be in the 1838 edition of register of ships with the notation built of iron the first rules of iron ships were published in the 1855 register these were revised and the classification symbol updated in 1870 the iron bark lizzy lesley was the first iron vessel to be signed as a new notation marty's cross 101 Ella Sawyer has continued to involved in many exciting projects in 19th and 20th century and our rules has been revised and updated considerably to support the industry demands. Today we have a very versatile set of rules which have been developed based on the extensive research and development, ships and service experiences, industry feedbacks and application feedbacks. We have many experts in various fields including stress analysis, automations, electricity, refrigeration, metallurgy, structural engineering if you name it and lr is a very unique organization which is proven in history and focused on the future so from let's see let's list to the leviathans of the sea be classified so this is a classical example of um, uh, spreading of various rules lr has been developed to cater for the marine and offshore industry so it started with the ship rules and uh, rules for testing of materials naval ship rules special service craft inland waterways great lakes rules and it goes to timer trimaran acquisition vehicles container lashings and um, yeah, winterizations ice class etc so the uh, the basic uh, aim of this um, session is to highlight two of the rules which is applicable for sea going commercial vessels so from these uh, the one i i highlighted about are uh, two rules that is rules and regulation for classification of ships and um, rules and regulation for classification of special service craft rules so these are the two topic uh, basically the first one uh, i i will skip in this one but these are the two basic rules which will be applied on um, ships uh, commercial ship sea going ships and i'll be explaining more on the second one which is special service craft rules so i'll basically brief the ship rules here and we'll limit the topic here the history of lr ship rules is a bit like history of lr itself the rules were initiated not so long after the company was started and since then it has developed with the ships that have emerged as new technology become apparent and they continue to do so for example just recently we have updated the container ships rules considering the quite larger length uh, because uh, container ships has length has quite enormously increased because of carrying capacity now it has seen more than 20000 tu containers are being carried so whipping and um, uh, or springing effect and all are been considered while designing of these ships so rules has been uh, updated considering that 
So the way the structural rules of ship rules has been split is between part three and part four. So part three contains very generic information which can be applied generically for all the ship rules designs vessel, and part four is ship specific. So ship specific means it can be tug specific. There are various chapters for each specific ships, tugs, offshore supply vessels, container ships, etc. So in partnership with the ship rules, we have uh, developed a software which name is Rules Calc software. Many of you might have probably experienced while designing uh, ship rules uh, class with the Lars, and uh, it ensures a greater compliance against these rules. So uh, usually uh, designers submit uh, Rules Calc file while submitting the structural drawings. So I'll limit my briefing on ship rules here, and let's focus on the core topic. So firstly, we'll start with a case study, selecting correct rules to apply. So this is a basically a flow chart. Uh, before briefly explaining on the flow chart, I'll give you a simple idea of how to select ship rules or SSC rules. So keep in mind that all the conventional seagoing vessels, which is basically uh, uh, ships which are carrying cargoes and it should be stronger to be in the sea. Uh, so those ships, by default, we have to apply. Ship rules and uh, those lighter crafts, for instance, multi hull crafts, catamaran, uh, then um, made of uh, aluminium composites, yacht, patrol vessels, pilot boats, and small work boats, crew boats, smaller passenger ships, etc. And if um, operation is quite near to the shore, or um, depending on the ship types, it can go unrestricted even, but it's not carrying larger cargoes. So, those vessels um, you can apply SSC rules. So another thing you have to keep in note is that uh, for SSC rules, uh, there is a cutoff for a free boat. So basically, the T by D ratio should be less than or equal to 0 0.55. What it means is that you should have at least 45% free boat. And all those vessels, respective of uh, cargo carrying vessels, complying with the ship rules. If vessel rule length is um, less than 24 meter, you can freely apply SSC rules. So that's an overall idea of how it is selected. So let's do a simple case study to reinforce this particular uh, details I've given. So first case study is uh, rule length 60 meter and primary function is yacht. Keep in note that it's a yacht. And other information is it's an aluminum catamaran unrestricted service. So the correct rules we can apply is SSC rules. Because it's a, it's not a, a cargo carrying vessel. It's a yacht, and it have multi hull, so that uh, reinforces that um, it can, uh, you can use SSC rules. The second case study is a 70 meter uh, LOA vessel. Primary function is offshore supply and traditional mono hull, unrestricted services. Without any doubt, we can say it is ship rules because offshore supply vessels are those vessels which has to station keep in a moderate or harsh environment near to the offshore assets. So she sh should be very strong to have that um, capability to withstand that enormous loads comes in. Then the case study three is LOA 20 meter, primary function workboard or even tuck and uh, steel hull. So you, you, you know that uh, I have said before that tugs are conventional vessels and she should be stronger. But on the other hand, the vessel length is less than 20 meter. So by looking at the tug, we get a feel that it is ship rules, but looking at the length, you get a feel that it can have an either. So we have a liberty to choose based on the owner requirements. Like if owner want to customize the vessels and have a very scandling optimization, uh, owner can choose um, ship, um, SSC rules, but on, on the other hand, it should have a bigger ballot pool and uh, sh uh, ship should be very strong, then go for ship rules. So it is a liberty to cho choose. So either of these can be applied. So that's how holistically we apply uh, SSC rules or ship rules. So now we go through the core topic of this session that is SSC structure design. So I'll start with uh, giving a little brief of, of the background, how this rule has been formed. So where does this SSC rule came from and uh, why were they developed? Well, the SSC rule was first released in 1996. So they were quite a bit newer than the ship rules. I said in the earlier the slides that ship rules was, the history of ship rules is history of LR itself. So it has a long years of history. 
So SSC rules is relatively a newer rules. Originally, they replaced and expanded upon the old rules for yachts and small craft, which were developed in 1987. And the old provisional rules for classification of high-speed craft published in 1991. They were developed as a response to changing international regulations and an ever emerging uh, stronger need for a, a lighter crafts such as um, surface effects ships, um, uh, SWATs, then air cushion vehicles, and mono and uh, multi hull forms. So, when these rules were developed, it was decided to take a new approach in the design, such as decoupling, like um, it's not uh, based on the conventional empirical formula method. So, the pressure will be calculated for the operation area then uh, we'll go for scandling derivation based on the pressure driven formulas and there will be an acceptance criteria and together with that we can do a free analysis or first principle calculations and optimize the uh, craft for the actual needs so another key concept of this ssc rule is to assign an operational envelope so basically when you design a ssc rules ships there will be an operation envelope so that particular operation envelope is to be kept on board uh, as a displayed in wheelhouse so that masters know that where is the limitation of her so if speed is to be reduced when there is a high se state or something then he can or she, he or she can reduce the speed so basically there will be an operation envelope followed by uh, ssc rules applications so now we go through the methodology followed these are the i'm going to brief the various steps involved from initial to final compliance So we will start defining the environment where the, we operate. So before starting the design of an SSC rules applicable ships, we need to know where she is operating, operating because this is a very customized vessel and uh, scandling optimized for the for the uh, the very need. So because uh, all these high speed crafts are very weight sensitive boats, so if uh, slight increase in scandling will will end up in having a penalty for increasing speed. So it is to be very cautious in selecting the environment where she is operating, and we derive an operation envelope for the vessel in the beginning. And then after that, based on the environment and operation envelope, we calculate the demand and load. So uh, the loads will be quite optimized. Uh, the loads for ships operating in unrestricted service will be different from the ships operating near coast or uh, 150 nautical mile from the uh, shore. So each ships will have a, a different loads based on the area of operations and range to refuse from the shore. And after that, we'll do a strength assessment based on the pressure derived from uh, environment and load. Then we uh, do the strength assessment either by using empirical based, empirical formula is directly pressure driven one, or doing direct calculations. For instance, if you are using um, uh, very unique items, which is not a, a normal class, um, classification formula for loan. For instance, crane support structures, or you have a very huge slamming in the forward, or you 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 have a uh, you need to limit the draft forward to reduce the slamming effect. And uh, in such cases, uh, we need to do, end up doing direct calculations. So you have to use FE analysis. But pressure can be derived from SSC rules. Then we have a separate acceptance criteria for each um, aspects, and we and if it is not complying, then go back again, increase the scanlings, and check against acceptance criteria. This is a cyclic process, and finally we optimize our scanling for the basic needs. And after, upon completion, that will go to a detailed design. The, it is quite important that it is not just simple uh, the generic structure. The ship should have a very good end connections as well. So there are, we have experienced quite a lot of failures uh, on um, on various crafts operating under SC. So, so we have a rich experience of feedbacks from in services and base, collecting all these things. We have formulated a detailed design repo uh, booklet, which contains quite a lot of information on do's and do's, don'ts, when there's other connections. Yep. Uh, so the, the, this is how the, the process is completed. So as I said before, it is prescriptive or empirical method and uh, first principle is... So now let's go through in detail of all these steps. So first is about the environment and operation envelope. So environment conditions include the uh, natural phenomena such as wind, 
wave and current from which design uh, data are to be derived the environment conditions are usually developed by physical variables of statistical nature the load criteria used for design are based on the environment data for that particular area and operation of the craft so you can see a table that like a service area notation factor so these are the factors multiplied into the formula when you select uh, the specific zone where this vessel is operating so i'll name it like um, the g1 is near to the shore which is basically limiting the vessel to operate within 5 nautical miles from the shore so basically g1 is not a sea going vessel g2 onwards is considered as a sea going vessel so g2 is um, less than or equal to 20 nautical miles uh, in reasonable weather g2a less than or equal to 16 nautical miles in reasonable weather and you can see that uh, various significant wave heights assigned for um, uh, each zones for operation so basically operation envelope is nothing but it's a combination of speed specific displacement for a particular uh, wave heights so that's considered as a loading condition for uh, the design of uh, ssc craft so you can have a multiple loading conditions for various displacements and speeds and finally software we have a software to uh, consider for this and software will take the most onerous one out of these loading conditions and generate the pressure distribution throughout the hull so significant wave height i'm sure many of you know but i'll tell that it's basically a wave height in meters used in determining the motions and loads uh, basically it's a uh, one third um, highest wave in short term wave measurement record so operation envelope is not required for all as special service craft it is basically um, uh, uh, display those crafts which are displacement in operation do not need uh, um, uh, operation envelope but for multi hull craft high speed craft and light displacement crafts need operation envelope but i'll give you a little explanation on what are these so in ssc rules there are two principal mode of operations considered so one is displacement which is covered under part 5 chapter 4 of the rules and another is non displacement which is part 5 and chapter 3 so these are the uh, two main uh, aspects so displacement craft do not need operation envelope and non displacement craft require operation envelope so what are they so in, in simple terms displacement mode of operations where the weight of the craft is fully or almost entirely supported by the hydrostatic force and non displacement craft is where the craft is substantially supported by non hydrodynamic forces so that's a uh, simple differences so uh, i'll i'll touch on uh, uh, a very brief on uh, high speed hydrodynamics so at zero speed the uh, the weight of the craft is entirely balanced by hydrostatic forces so as the speed of the craft increases to a point sometimes we refer it as a hump speed and the craft is light enough that the hydrodynamic forces acting vertically may be uh, sufficient to provide a small amount of lift and partially raise the hull allowing the craft to enter into a semi displacement regime so at higher speeds the hydrodynamic forces may balance the weight of the craft creating a substantial lift and and in rough uh, water the, the force may completely overrun and uh, and completely out of water so we know that uh, uh, you might be knowing that uh, the fruit number basically it's a dimensional number used to determine the resistance of a partially submerged hull moving through the water and this facilitate comparison of similar hulls of uh, different sizes so for simplicity we can say that um, uh, 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 for the different hull forms like displacement semi displacement and fully planing uh, for displacement hulls usually we have a round bilge and offer lowest resistance at displacement speed so we typically say that uh, those vessels will have fruit number less than 0.5 and for semi displacement hulls we may either have a rounded wheel or hard chine and offer better resistance at semi displacement uh, speeds so for this semi displacement uh, the fruit number will be between 0.5 and uh, this is typically between 0.5 and uh, 1 and another is fully planing where hull hull forms are very hard chine and uh, 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 fruit number is higher than 1 but in uh, uh ssc rules we are not using fruit numbers uh, while determining whether displacement or non displacement mode so in practice uh, the transition between displacement mode and non displacement mode will take place at a particular speed between displacement mode and the planing mode 
general so ssc rule consider that craft with a taylor quotient so taylor quotient is nothing but v there's a formula called v by square root of lwl when it is higher than 3 it goes into a non displacement mode and if if it is less than 3 it goes into displacement mode that's how ssc rules uh, consider the cutoff between displacement and non displacement so governing limits to determine the, uh, are be, there are formulas to uh, confirm this so and uh, we consider a combination like uh, displacement light displacement light displacement plus planing or uh, simply planing depending on the combination of this uh, um, uh, taylor quotient and uh, light displacement formula so this is a classical example of um, um, uh, operation envelope so you can see that uh, there is a graph drawn here here uh, what it means is that ma uh, for a particular displacement you can see it is 109.4 a vessel used to operate a vessel can operate up to up to 4 meter significant wave height till uh, speed 30 knots and uh, if the speed is increasing uh, then uh, it should be based on gradually red, uh, uh, reduce based on a significant wave height a reduction in significant wave height and uh, it can operate up to 45 knots at a significant wave height 1.5 meter but if there is a harsh weather where significant wave height is more than 4 so where master can choose either to lower down the speed and make the vessel in displacement mode or uh, seek refuge so master this is to be displayed in wheelhouse to get a clear idea of the limitation of the vessel so all non displacement crafts and light displacement craft lr issue and also also multi hull crafts lr issues operation and well so the next topic is we generate loads so we uh, selected environment where the vessel is operating and after that uh, time for calculating the loads so it is uh, developed based on uh, parametric sea keeping study and um, some of us know that there is a paper called saviski and ward brown basically that particular paper is referred while um, um, calculating this um, vertical accelerations considering chine or round bilge displacement or planing mode of operations and also for mono or multi hull hull forms and also we have done quite an extensive research and development and um, continuous in service feedbacks we keep on uh, updating our rules in 2002 lr to reinforce and validate this uh, lr has carried out an extensive full scale testing programs at 50 knots and uh, studied the impact pressures and accelerations uh, and uh, and the formula has been updated further so the various modes of operation i have already explained um, um planing or semi planing hsc or ldc so these are the formula which determines um, whether vessel is high speed craft or light displacement craft so you can see in the right side there is a formula v is equal to 7.1819 volumetric displacement raised to 1 by 6 so what it means is that if your actual speed is um, 20 knots and uh, the calculated speed is 21 knots then vessel won't be high speed craft but your actual speed is greater than the calculated speed then vessel is supposed to be in high speed craft and we assign hsc notations and similarly for light displacement craft you can see the formula 0.04 length into breadth raised to 1.5 so what it means is that when your actual displacement is lesser than this calculated one then vessel will be in a light light displacement craft mode and if it is higher than that if it, it is um, a displacement craft and again taylor quotient this is a cut off that determines either displacement or non displacement so if it is a taylor quotient is greater than 3 that means vessel will be operating in non displacement mode and if it is less than 3 that means vessel is operating in a displacement mode so we use a combination of all these approaches to determine whether there is a need for operation envelope and uh, you don't need to worry there is a software to do it and uh, uh, that confirms that all these parameters are considered while making the then we make a judgment based on the outcome in the old days i used to manually calculate and determine this but now we have a software to support it so when we talk about the loads there are two loads one is global loads and second is local loads global load is nothing but which determines um, the the holistic uh, holistic hull itself so vessel is to comply with um, uh, the hogging and sagging uh, loads as a whole and uh, local loads are those ones which is locally acting on the structures so 
it could be anything like um, forward impact or sloshing or load due to containers on deck or it could be load due to uh, container uh, uh, cranes etc and uh, finally we need to have a minimum thickness what it means is that um, there will be a calculated one and minimum thickness so what i mean to say minimum is that um, vessel should have a minimum robustness for example ssc crafts are quite lighter crafts for sometimes you might, might see uh, thickness calculated is 2.5 mm so what the rule says is that you have to have a minimum for robustness for instance like if it is on the deck somebody is carrying um, quite heavy equipment and um, it just fall down it should not rupture the plate so there should have a minimum robustness so due to that reason we have decided that um, uh, there will be a cut off thickness to have a minimum robustness and corrosion effect and uh, any, any of the derived scanlings should be either equal to that or it should be higher than that so this minimum robustness is the bare benchmark for all these calculations so we calculate for global loads local loads and uh, minimum robustness thicknesses and finally we decide the scanlings i'll just um, briefly go through many of us know what it is um, hogging is uh, when um, uh, when the wave crust is at the middle of the ship so the phenomenon here is that the, your deck will be under tensile and uh, bottom will be under compressors compressive stress uh, the failure will be if you don't have a, enough uh, stiffness in the bottom there will be a, a compressive buckling so uh there will be formula determine the critical compressive compressive buckling of the blade panel and uh, you will derive the actual compressive stress and if it is uh, higher than the critical compressive stress that means uh, that plate will collapse so we precisely calculate and see whether it complies or not for the hogging effect for the bottom structures and uh, for the sagging uh, the two crust at the ends and the vessel will be having a compressive stress in the deck and tensile in the bottom and a similar approach we'll do for the deck to see whether compressive buckling is satisfied or not or not and similarly for shear uh, buckling we check all for the longitudinal uh, continuous members for instance uh, deep girders longitudinal bulkheads etc so shear capacity is checked in in similar approach and for container ships sorry uh, catamarans and multi hull crafts we calculate for the cross stacks so there are three c's uh, three types of uh, c's considered like head c beam c and quartering c and depending on that the torsional effect of cross stack is checked and we ensure that uh, cross stack is is good for this um, approaching c's and um, should be robust enough to withstand all these uh, bending effect this is to be additionally carried out for multi hull craft and the previous ones are for mono hull crafts so multi hull crafts you have to carry out the longitudinal strength and on top of that this cross stack assessment is to be carried out these are uh, various um, that's that ends about the global loads and now it is about the local loads local loads i already said that it is basically localized loads it could be static loads wave induced loads impact loads in the forward and bottom slamming and bow fly slamming then a sloshing in partially filled tanks when there is a resonance between a uh, natural frequency and the uh, uh, frequency due to the motions of the fluid within inside due to bore and uh, standing waves then uh, cyclic load resulting from the main engine or or propeller induced vibrational forces uh, transient loads such as thermal loads residual loads when suppose vessel is operating in ice conditions such as finnish swedish ice class areas or polar regions then uh, ice induced loads that methodology is completely different it this is a, co um, a plastic approach uh, due to the collision of icebergs or ice so localized uh, loads are to be determined while driving the scanlings so these are some picturesque rep representation this is bow flare slamming and the second one is um, uh, sloshing uh, ship passing through ice areas so um, there will be an ice belt it has to be designed considering the side impact due to the ice drifting then uh, winches direct loads uh, foundations are to be checked based on the breaking strength of the mooring lines then um, uh, board davits based on the safe working load of uh, hand lowering and uh, lifting of these uh, davits we need to calculate uh, the strength and very high factor safety is to be used if it is um, uh, life boats uh, as per solar it is to be 4.5 times and we can go up to plastic uh, need not be yield 
so these are the various chapters we referred while determining the local analysis for section 4 uh, within part 5 chapter 2 is the loads for determining the shell envelope basically hydrostatic and hydrodynamic weight loads are calculated and duct loads will be calculated and section 5 calculate the impact load basically in displacement and non displacement modes then section 6 is specifically for multi hull cross trucks will design the the haunch area and the the bottom uh, plate strength then uh, section 7 is a component basically bulkheads it is designed for a uh, water head then deck house for con considering the air pressure and the site wind pressure then uh, pillars based on the direct vertical load coming above and uh, deck cargo based on the uh, unified uh, wdl whether distributed load or uniformly distributed load Uh, deck structures are to be designed so this is a classical example of how this formulas are arranged so i'll i'll just pick one of the uh, simplest form this is basically it says that delta f into hf into gf into sf into cf so this is how this uh, formula is spreaded so delta f is nothing but um, uh, the, the type of stiffeners used so if you are using primary stiffener so you can use 0.5 factor so it calculate half of what it is required for plate a plate it is a, a one no doubt and a secondary and localized stiffening mass delta f is to be taken as 0.8 so next is a hull notation factor so when you have a high speed craft or light displacement craft you remember previously i said that high speed craft is nothing but when your speed is uh, 7.1 9 into volumetric displacement raised to 1 by 6 if it is higher than that then you have to choose this uh, hf factor as 1 and if it is light displacement uh, craft then uh, uh, you have you can choose a lower one 0.95 can be taken then uh, another is uh, gf depending on the zones and uh, range to refuge g6 is unrestricted services and g1 is within 5 nautical mile from the shore and g2 is within 20 g2a is within 60 g3 is within 150 nautical miles g4 is within 250 nautical miles and g5 is within 350 nautical miles so based on the increasing range to refuge that factor is increased so you can see that um, uh, that factor will be multiplied when you select the hull form and uh, next is a uh, service type factor we know that uh, some ships are tend to station keeping if there is a rough weather for example you have a pilot boat the ship has to go and take the pilot if the vessel if uh, the um, uh, environment is harsh or benign she has to go and take the pilot so in those scenarios we take a, um, we have a service factor 1.25 and you can see work boat it's a work horse basically in sea and for that one also 1.25 but for other craft uh, cargo a or passenger Uh, uh she can re uh, uh, seek to re uh, refuge if the environment is not so great then uh, she can seek refuge so in that case uh, the factor is taken only one so these are the combinations selected while uh, while determining the pressure and another factor is craft type notation factor this is basically the base based on the hull form so for multi hull and catamaran you can see 1.1 and for swath it is only one uh, catamaran also one multi hull one mono it is one then rigid inflatable boat it is 1.15 so depending on the hull uh, craft type this factor is selected and this is multiplied and finally this will be used as a factor in enhancing or degrading the uh, pressure we calculated depending on the environment hull form and uh, the type of operations and this is completely done by ssc software but you can manually calculate as well uh, there, there is a methodology and uh, formulas and guidance how to do it so while uh, developing this ssc rules it was decided that load shedding theory is followed so what it means is that when vessel is at sea the 100% pressure is absorbed by the plate and 80% is transferred to secondary stiffness and finally only 50% is transferred to primary stiffness so th this load shedding theory is used while uh, deriving the pressures for uh, scanning derivations so now we have 
talk about environment we select the environment where this vessel operates and after that load is calculated and next we will do the strength assessment strength assessment is basically carried out by benchmarking against the material yield strength that is for steels and for aluminium it is based on 0.2 percent pro stress so in aluminium there are two stresses one is welded condition and unwelded condition aluminium phenomena is as it gets colder it gets stronger so as it gets heated the strength reduces so in ships we will be welding throughout the hull so so welded condition is generally used while determining the scanlings so you can see the differences based on various materials it's nearly half for example these are the commonly used materials 5083h116 h116 you can see unwelded is 215 and welded is 125 and another material which is used for extrusions are 6082 you can see that um, Unwelded condition is 240 newton per millimeter square and welded is 125. So basically while doing the strength assessment, we use this welded condition uh, uh, properties and we need to comply the material scan things. So while designing the structure, we need to consider these four aspects. One is strength itself. So it should comply for the yield and 0.2% pro stress or for composites uh, based on the laying up strength and uh, should have a minimum stiffness and uh, it should have a minimum robustness we are durability we already talked about that that is complied based on the minimum thickness uh, that benchmark is there you should not even if you are doing direct calculations such as for finite elements and all even if it is passing for 2.2 mm we cannot use it we should use the minimum thickness governor uh, advised by the rules if it is 3 mm or 3.4 mm depending on the location we need to pick that and finally structure should be redundant like one single failure should not lead to a catastrophic failure of the structures so structure should be redundant so these all four as parameters are considered while designing of a structure and uh, we talk we talk about the prescriptive analysis now it is a uh, direct calculations in rules um, sometimes um, if um, vessel parameters are going overboard for example, for monohull, the cutoff length for um, uh, prescriptive um, for global strength is 90 meter. So if uh, length exceeds 90 meter, you need to do global strength by FE analysis. Then for catamarans and multi-hulls, the cutoff length is 60 meter. So below 60 meter, you can uh, do the global strength by simple rule empirical formulas. And the strength can be validated by using uh, um, geometrical properties of that particular cross sections but if it is going above 60 meter uh, it is to be validated by using finite element analysis and you have a very slender designs like novel designs and all you need to do finite element analysis and also you can do this finite element analysis for structural optimizations as well so these are some of the classical examples which i have particularly done for a um, few vessels one uh, the top one is an opv and second one is a catamaran where it is um, because the length is itself is about 65 meter so we ended up doing a fee analysis to validate the strength of this cross tech so we talk about environment vessel operates and after that loads created and strength assessed and finally we need to check whether it is okay or not that is we have various acceptance criteria so for plate it is validated based on the minimum thickness based on the bending stress limit and st uh, stiffener the minimum section modulus and um, inertia minimum web area for sh having a uh, shear capacity and there is a um, for uh, stability of the stiffener there is a minimum web depth by thickness ratio and for pillar it is a buckling limit and for all these uh, 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 scanlings there should be a minimum thickness for robustness so it is benchmarked against these ones so your proposed one should be higher than the rule calculated one you can you can either e equate or you should go for a higher one for example the calculated is 5.3 mm so you should select 6 mm for that particular area and uh, uh, there are failure control modes for deflections and then stresses so within all the chapters within the ssc rules for example part 6 is applied for steel structure 
part seven is applied for aluminum and part eight is for composites. So within this part six, part seven and part eight, the last one is chapter seven failure control mode. So within this chapter, there is a uh, deflection, stress, buckling and vibration failure control modes. So these uh, uh, limits are given and you have to make sure that uh, you should not go beyond that. So that's the basically the acceptance criteria for various structural members for these phenomena. Okay, uh, for global strength, the ship rules, uh, it is uh, simply 65 meter length. Any vessels going above 65 meter has to have a, uh, a longitudinal strength compliance. That's mandatory for ship rules. But for SSC rules, due to vessel is quite um, lighter and um, very uh, customized for the uh, basic operation where it is needed. So it will be less scandal. So that's the reason uh, the length for global strength compliance is even reduced from the ship rules. So I have made a table for easy reference. What is that? For steel monohull, when vessel length goes beyond 50 meter rule length, you have to have a global strength compliance. And multi-hull steel, it is 40 meter cutoff. And for aluminum, similarly monohull, it is 45 meter is a cutoff length for global strength. And for multi-hull aluminum, it is 40 meter. On the other hand, composites, for monohull, it's only 40 meter. And for multi-hull, it is only 35 meter. So composite constructed uh, multi-hull, if the vessel is more than 35 meter rule length, you have to ensure global strength compliance. So that means longitudinal strength and cross-track assessment for catamarans and longitudinal strength only for mon monohull vessels. So in summary, acceptance criteria is um, for stiffener, it is a section modulus, inertia, uh, minimum uh, uh, web area, and um, stability of the stiffness. For plating, it is minimum thickness. And for global hull, it is a minimum inertia and uh, section modulus. And every, all the scanning members should have a minimum thickness, that is for robustness. So I'll summarize the process map followed here. First, Based on SSC rules part three, we calculate um, um, operation envelope. And uh, after operation envelope, we calculate the loads, basically uh, the aspect what we referred as um, uh, part five. And after that, we check the capability of the stru structure. Part six is for aluminum, sorry, part six is for steel, part seven is for aluminum, and part eight is for composite. And using the material properties, we assess the strength. And finally, the criteria, acceptance criteria is this strength versus acceptance criteria is benchmarked based on the, the last chapters of each part, so that is failure control modes. And uh, this process completes. Uh, design. And the final one is we need to have a detailed design guidance. After completing the structural design, we need to go have a look whether it complies the detailed design uh, guidances. Why it is needed? Basically, most structural failures that occur in the service of the craft is due to fatigue. So fatigue is basically when you have a cyclic load for a particular structure for a longer period of time, this premature failure occurs. This is not because of the yield failure, because of the cyclic nature of this um, uh, 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 loads. So quality of uh, detailed design is fundamental if design life is to be attained. As speed greatly increases, area for, for detailed design become more prone to fatigue cracking. So we have quite a lot of feedback received from our in-services and uh, considering all these in-service feedback, LR has um, built up a detailed design guidance, giving uh, an idea of do's and don'ts when you have an end connection. For instance, when you are terminating two stiffness, which is having a different depth, it should be smoothly translated and you are uh, having an end that um, particular abrupt area, you need to connect by bracketing and uh, in some areas bracket toes and uh, vertical well should not coincide. It should be away from the um, low transitions and you should have a, a greater notch radius. And for start and stop of aluminums, the, you will be always seeing greater cracks. So it should, you should be very cautious in grinding of all these spots. So these kind of uh, very detailed guidance is given um, while designing of this um, structures. Some of the failures I'll show here. So you can see a fracture because due to an inappropriate doubler being used. Um, then um, this is a, 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 a rupture due to 
high corrosion localized it could be due to uh, inappropriate painting or due to cyclic loads you can see here that um, there is a requirements within rules for guidance that uh, uh, none of the brackets should be terminated on unsupported plate of panel so you can see it, there is nothing below supported so these kind of things to be avoided otherwise you will end up uh, seeing cracks as ages then another one i said earlier is that um, the toe of the bracket and uh, the the well should not coincide so that there will be a good tendency to crack and um, this is this is this is calling for a need to have a rider bars on the free edge of this um, particular bracket so when uh, when you have a longer welder arm length so it says the cutoff length is about i think for 50 mm so if it goes beyond that your free edge is to be reinforced by rider bars otherwise we'll end up this kind of scenarios so now we'll look up at the look on the class notations so this is a classical class notation spreaded so after completing this you will be having a fair idea of what its significance so establishing the environment that the ship will operate in the early on will provide a number of benefits that will help the design optimizations uh, during the design spiral it will help to establish hull notations and therefore any factors associated with the ship and environment so you can see 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 six distinct characters the first one is a classical examples of um, uh, all uh, lr um, class vessels multi cross 100a1 multi cross means uh, uh, vessel is built under special survey 100 means uh, sea going a means uh, it is maintained to class 1 means vessel have effective mooring and anchoring arrangement so multi cross 100a1 will be similar for ship rules and ssc so the identity which it distinguish whether it is ssc or ship rules is the symbol ssc so if your class notation have the term ssc that means vessel is designed to ssc then the second uh, is a service type notations which can be either cargo passenger petrol pilot yacht workboat and uh, the recent year we have introduced a new uh, service type it's called wind farm service vessel so this leads to the service type notation factor which account for the fact that some vessels are expected to work in much more onerous sea states in comparison to the uh, to complete their daily service such as pilot boats where some other crafts are more likely to seek refuge in um, very bad weather conditions that is a sf factor i have shown in the previous slides that what is the factor considered for work boat and passenger the next is about the craft type notation this is basically this can be either uh, swath or mono hull or multi hull so this cf factor comes in and uh, depending on the type of the uh, this thing uh, uh, that factors can be multiplied on the formula and uh, will uh, enhance or degrade the pressure calculations and the fourth one is um, high speed or uh, light displacement craft high speed craft is determined based on the formula 7.19 into volumetric displacement raised to 1 by 6 and your actual vessel speed is higher than that then vessel is high speed and if it is lower than lower than that it is normal displacement craft so normal displacement craft won't be having this hsc notation and ldc similarly 0.04 into ln to b raised to 1.5 so if your calculated actual displacement is lower than this particular calculated one vessel is light displacement otherwise it will be simply a displacement mode and you don't you can have or you don't need to have these fourth one hsc or ldc notations it is an it is based on the vessel capability but the first three will be there and uh, fifth is service area notation so this is basically a letter g followed by the numbers 1 to 6 so one means near to shore so when it is g1 there won't be 100 in the first symbol you can see multi cross 100 so when it is g1 that 100 won't be there because it is not a sea going vessel but for g2 to g6 the 100 will be there so g1 means within 5 nautical miles from the shore and it is operating under sheltered water g2 is within 20 nautical miles and operation only in reasonable weather g3 is within 150 nautical miles and g4 g5 and goes on and up to g6 is unrestricted service 
and basically limiting to uh, uh, petrol rafts and uh, if I'm not wrong, yeah, yachts. Only for these two, this is applied. And finally, there are, there are other hull notations. These are ranges of extras which can be assigned if the ship is assigned to comply with the required rules. This can be this can include ice class. In this instance, we have shown it is uh, star IWS. That means in water survey is carried out. And it could be a LI, that means loading instrument, SRY, it, SRY means it is short range yachts. Short range yachts are limited for operation for G2A only. And uh, then shipwright ACB, or uh, it could be anti collision system rotations, it could be anything. So that is an optional one, depending on additional capability vessel have. So these factors will lead directly into the calculations of the loads on the ships. And um, another output from this will be operational envelope for that particular ship. So that will be a basically a visual indication of which is normally given to the master of the vessels. I've shown in the earlier slides how it looked like. So when uh, the vessel goes beyond that envelope, then vessel is to be either slow down the speed or seek refuge. So now I'll show you some classical examples of LR class uh, special service crafts and notations and we'll identify what is the significance based on from this class notations. So uh, this is a yacht, multi-cross 101 SSE. So we know that it is an SSE craft. It is fully uh, classed and maintained seagoing vessel. And this is a yacht. Mono means it is single hull and G6 means unrestricted service. So you can, you have seen that um, speed is 13 to 14 knots. So vessel is not high speed craft because there is no HSE notation. So this is a normal displacement, unrestricted service yacht, which is having a mono hull. So another example, multi-cross under one, it is a fully maintained and under special survey, built under special survey. It's a SSE vessel, yacht mono G6. So this is the same, same other, but there will be a, uh, another addition notation like uh, I, I missed to add here. It is basically sail, uh, I think it is uh, the term as uh, uh, sail assisted. So that means uh, there will be sail assisted propulsion. So that will be added on top of it. And the speed is only 10 to 12. So uh, there is no HSC notation. That means this is not a high speed craft. So here is another example fully maintained and built under special survey to LR, passenger catamaran. So it is a, having a vessel have twin hulls. So now you, you know that uh, speed, it's a high speed craft, which is HSE. So the speed could be uh, higher than uh, those calculated from volumetric displacement, sorry, 7.19 into volumetric displacement raised to one by six. So actual speed is higher than this particular calculated value. So that's why vessel is non-displacement and uh, a restriction is G2A, that means vessel can operate up to 0, 06, uh, 16 nautical miles from the shore. It cannot go beyond that. And this vessel will be having an operation envelope. And uh, those ones shown previously do not need to have an operation envelope. This particular vessel will have operation envelope because it is a high speed craft. And it is a catamaran, multi hull. And the rigid inflatable boats, high speed craft, fully built and uh, maintained to allow rules. And uh, vessel is composite construction, non-displacement. G3 means uh, range refuges within 150 nautical miles from the shore. And another is uh, fully built and maintained to class SSC. Cargo A, single hull. G4 means uh, within 250 nautical miles from the shore. And, uh, and it is not HSC craft. That means it is a displacement mode of operation. This is a super yacht. 101 SSC yacht mono G6. That means uh, unrestricted services. Now you can see the speed itself is 30 knots, but the vessel length is 77. So 7.19 to volumetric displacement uh, is not, is higher than 30 knots. It could be 33 or 32. And actual speed is only 30 knots. It is less than uh, um, uh, the calculated value. That is why HSC notation is not given. So that's um, end of the site. Now what I'll do is that I will show a brief um, glance through of um, the software. Uh, okay, 
Are you able to see this um, uh, software page? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, while starting, you have to do this. Okay, no, no problem. I'll, I'll go through this one itself. There is a, uh, a procedure you need to follow. That's from, uh, I couldn't show it because it is going to another page and um, not going here. So there will be a step-by-step -step guidance when you start. First, you have to key in all this um, principal particulars, uh, length, um, length between perpendiculars, rule, rule length is automatically calculated. So all these ones are manually keyed in once and um, all these um, um, gray area on our uh, software calculated one. Uh, if there is a global strength assessment required, you need to key in yes. So that is determined based on the, the length cutoff I explained earlier. If the vessel is sailing yacht on top of it, then you need to see yes. The reason why it is because um, all these rigging forces are to be calculated on top of the global strength. So it is combinedly assessed considering the rigging loads uh, together with the global strength. Then all these additional data are to be filled in. And, uh, and after that, it gives you an idea of um, the capability of vessel. So HSC complaint means, uh, complaint means it, is, um, it is a high speed craft because the speed is um, what it is here. It is 20 knots. And um, the calculated one is, you can find out here from here. The calculator one is 18.023. But the actual speed is 20. So it is higher than that. That is why. But suppose if your speed is uh, um, 16, then you can see it is no, because 16 is lower than 18.02. That's why. So software will automatically calculate and confirm you whether what is the capability of this vessel. So by looking at this particular section, you can see it is HSC complaint. It is not an LDZ craft because if, if you want to qualify LDZ, you need to be either 176.576 or lower. But our displacement is higher than that, 254. That is why it is not LDZ. Then vessel is planing mode because your Taylor quotient V by square root of LWL is higher than three. So uh, the required Actual calculated is 3.238 and the cutoff for is um, three, that's why. So it is a planning mode. So the vessel needs operation envelope, which is to be displayed in on board, uh, on wheelhouse. Then we will uh, define the framing systems. What are the frames involved? Uh, this is basically quite crucial uh, because any mistake in this area will uh, get you a wrong pressure in wrong location. So I have to be very cautious here. And this particular section will advise what are the equipment um, equipments required for that particular design, including the minimum mooring line length, breaking strength of the mooring, um, then selection of this um, anchors. Uh, then uh, what is the towing requirements and all. So SSC craft basically do not, it's not a classification requirement to have a tow line, but owners voluntarily follow that. And um, there is a requirement within the rules to pick up based on the calculated equipment number. So that's why it is not calculated because it is not a rule requirement. Then this is a uh, most crucial part. Anything wrong here will get you a wrong pressure. So you have to very cautious while filling this particular portion. Uh, specifically running trim angle, then um, this is basically uh, for uh, air gap and all of our catamarans is not applicable. For mono hull, you can avoid it. Then um, uh, the maximum breadth of hull at LCG, then LCG from off perpendicular, then uh, speed. So uh, based on this one, pressure will be generated. So you can see here, various pressure on distributor on the hull forms. So what SSE software do is that 
when you're designing uh, at frame 35 bottom hull it will pick the maximum value of this pressure hydrodynamic wave pressure or pitching or bottom impact or uh, or uh, for body impact pressure so of which it picks the maximum one and that particular pressure will be used while deriving the scanlings in the olden days i used to manually calculate and uh, distribute this and pick up the uh, pressure but now software do everything for us so it's life has become quite easier than olden days now another is a uh, global loads a little tricky in SSC, but she proves it is quite straightforward and very easy but in SSC we need to uh, uh, wave bending moment is automatically calculated but still water bending moment we need to key in manually so that is done here shear force and uh, bending moment and uh, it it distributes shear forces and uh, wave bending wave and um, wave shear and wave bending moment it is calculated and then we need to calculate this global uh, by combining here if it is uh, sagging we need to drop down what it has been calculated for and then uh, wave is to be picked up based on hogging or sagging and uh, still water bending moment whatever we have manually keyed in are to be picked up and it gives you an envelope of uh, global loading distributions. This is similarly done for shear. Then we need to define what are the materials applicable for the structure. In this case, uh, it is built of um, steel, hull, and um, superstructure, and of course, built of aluminum. So there is a uh, library where you can pick uh, the materials. So this is the library area. Sorry, not this one. So if it is a material, you can choose all these materials from it, aluminum. And for steel, you can choose from here. Similarly, for profiles, you can either customize and create your own sections or pick it from all these options. So profiles, it's quite easy to create one. I'll show you a sample. Uh, insert. So a T section, I can name it here. 100 by 10 plus 50 by 12. So this is only for name, but actually we need to key in here. So it could be built or rolled. So I'll select build here. So 100 depth, web thickness 10, flange breadth 50, and the flange thickness 12. So we can calculate the even section more or less everything without um, using this um, scandling calculation area. So you will get a uh, for uh, with that we have, we always have to consider the attached plate while calculating the geometric properties. And the software will give you the various geometric properties here. So after generating the materials and profile, if uh, the global strength is applied, then we need to create a cross section of this one. It's quite easy to model. Just select the panel and uh, uh, flat line, and you can just model and uh, define what is the location this one and you can uh, complete it and this give you what is a um, section modulus involved and this particular uh, section modulus and inertia is used for uh, calculating the global bending moment so basically the bending stresses at deck and bottom and uh, then we calculate the structure, localized structure. Side plate, you need to key in uh, what is the type of material. Then uh, um, uh, what is the panel aspect ratio, length, width. 
and all these parameters you have to key in and it will say that it complies or not. So it says that the minimum required thickness is 4.055 and that particular area. So the, it displays here, um, this one, and you will be able to know where is the location you are calculating. It is frame 38. So you are calculating on those green items in the forward area. And uh, uh, the proposed the 6 mm and required is 4.055. So similarly, you can do for all areas of the shelf from aft to forward. Then a shell aft, uh, shell, shell side longitudinal stiffness, then bottom web frames. You can pinpoint any locations and see whether it complies or not. That's the beauty of this particular software. The whole hull it has been calculated by defining the locations and the type of um, this thing. And for pillars, you can calculate then superstructure, bulkheads, even for collision bulkheads. Then uh, deck structures. Then if there is a wheel loaded cargo, then uh, you can uh, uh, you can you can use this vehicle deck. So based on the tire print of the uh, wheels of the vehicle, it calculates. And uh, then superstructure. Similarly, if it is tier one or tier two, uh, if it is coach roof or or if it is side of the uh, uh, deck house, you can calculate. And we calculate the rudder rudder stock, then um, uh, you need to for, you need to have this rudder st strips. Then, uh, so uh, in short, you can calculate almost every aspects of um, ship scan links. But when you have a direct load involved areas, then you have to uh, use this FE analysis. So yeah, uh, that is a glance through of this particular software. And this brings me to the end of the session. And I would be happy to address any of your questions you have. Yeah. Wow. Uh, thank you, sir. This has been a very informative section for all of us from history of the LR to class notations to even to the uh, glance of the software. Uh, you have uh, give us very valuable information, which will be very useful for us uh, in our uh, in our uh, future careers. Yep. Uh, so, and for now, before getting into the Q and A section, yep. uh, I would like everyone to look at the chat box, and we will be providing the feedback form. So, kindly please fill the feedback form, and every sessions and feedback is highly appreciated. And then uh, our next section is Q&A section. Uh, so uh, we, all, uh, we have already we got a question right here. And I guess uh, we can go to the questions, right? So the first question is by uh, Jishnu PV. And he want to, uh, he said that, so what, ha and I quote, so what happened if Taylor co quotient is equal to three? Will it be displacement? or non-displacement mode? Okay. This what is the a, question posed by yeah, yeah. Uh, Good question. Uh, it is a, it's really a cutoff, cutoff value. So it says that it should be either greater than or equal to three. So if it is less than three, the vessel will go into displacement mode. But if it is three or higher than three, then vessel will go into non-displacement mode. So three or higher, it is non-displacement. And anything less than three, it is displacement. That's how. So when you when you calculated value V by square root of LWL, that is length on water line, if calculated is 2.99, then it is displacement mode. And if it is three or higher, it is non-displacement mode. Uh, thank you, sir. So if anyone else have uh, any questions, please unmute yourself and ask the questions. Uh, hi, Sajid. Uh, this is Sojan Anthony from uh, 13th batch. Um, MXABS. Uh, okay. I have a question. You you mentioned in passing uh, while talking about um, <clears throat> the LSA structure that it can go into plastic. Uh, could you go back to that slide and 
repeat what you said how can it go to plastic ls is it about yeah. ice class no 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 you way back in your presentation when you had life saving and uh, we, you showed a sketch oh, okay, with okay. Oh, life I, uh, okay 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 got it got it oh no, no no not here this is about the loads keep going back yeah, I, I, it's here yeah this one so when i talk about this one I no said, no there uh, was another uh, uh, yeah uh, probably yeah yeah this one, yeah. This one. okay uh, as for solars it says that um, uh, you when you use um, 4.5 safety factor the allowable stresses um, not yield it is ultimate strength so for example if you are using a, a mild steel your yield strength is 235 yeah and um, if uh, the david safe working yeah. load is um, 2 tons understood understood that yeah. that's not my question my question was you, you, you mentioned that it can go to plastic that yes. may not be an accurate statement because yeah yeah, yeah what yeah. happens there that is coming from the lsa code Uh, it's not from solus it's coming basically coming from lsa code yeah, you're right you're right and what it says is your working stress can and you know, the factor of safety 4.5 is applied on the ultimate strength correct 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 and yes, not yeah so when you apply 4.5 on your ultimate strength it it's not in plastic it is yeah, still Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I got your point. So it's basically we yeah. can go up to ultimate strength that is 440 newton per millimeter square. So while I no, say no, you I, cannot go, you cannot go to ultimate. You that you you are applying the factor of safety of 4.5 when you do that check. The you are applying that factor of safety on the ultimate strength. So when you do a, when you apply 4.5 on ultimate, it is nowhere near uh, plastic range. Yep. for for normal materials you what, know what I, what i mean to say is that when we calculating yeah. we we either apply that factor of safety or we reduce that from um the ultimate strength that's no. how it is yeah. yeah okay i i got what you are trying yeah. but yeah. i was yeah. i was explaining it for the information yeah. of the students yeah. listening that you cannot design these things yeah. to plastic yeah. Yeah. you you are you are doing it you are applying a factor of safety of 4.5 Yeah. on the ultimate strength rather than you know the normal uh, yeah. Yeah. what do you yeah. call that i forgot 235 for it's for 40 for 40 yeah for 40 yeah, <clears throat> yeah. yeah. the yeah. next question i have is on um, your notations could you go back to could you go back to the g g factors um yep no the slide with the g factors g1 g2 g3 yeah this one g1 g2 g3 yeah um so g2 also gets a 100 multi cross 100 yes actually only g1 is excluded from it from it it is basically operating within the sheltered waters so anything higher than g1 vessel is eligible to have this 100 multi cross so g2 and g3 what is the limit you said Six, uh, g1 is g2 is 20 miles from shore yes g2 and is and that's considered and that's considered 100 is usually for unrestricted sea service no it is sea going it's not unrestricted multi cross 100 100 means it is sea going sea going so yes. it's sea but 20 nautical miles from shore that's what you mean yes It's slightly different from what ABS gives. ABS that hundred means unrestricted service. Just, just, okay. uh, just for yeah. my understanding, I'm not very yeah. familiar with yeah. the yeah. loads hundred, rules. Hundred yeah. terminology is going. That's so okay. only only sheltered water is excluded from that assigning hundred. Okay, sheltered by sheltered, you mean? Um, uh, it is not defined. even cost. it is defined based on the distance from range ref refuge from the shore that is within 5 nautical miles from shore okay okay that's it yep uh thank you sir and okay so there is one question by mohammad shahid and i quote sir could you please tell more about the vehicle deck strength calculation vehicle deck 
okay um vehicle deck uh, usually we follow uh, there is a capability within uh, ssc software itself we need to define the tire print area and the vehicle axle loads but we normally encourage to do direct calculation so usually what i do is that i end up doing majority of the cases where vehicles are carried by using um, fe analysis so basically i model the area and uh, and apply the tire print areas together with the uh, vertical accelerations and see the capability of the structure so within the rules there are certain benchmarking against um, yield strength and we ensure that it complies for that so usually it is done by direct calculations for that particular vehicle tire print area and the axle load Uh, thank you, Shahid. Is there anyone else who would like to have a question? Please unmute yourself and ask a question. Or else, you could, uh, okay, there is another question by Ashwin Sunil. Yep. And I quote, Sir, both catamaran and squat are twin hull ships. Yep. So, will both have same large holes? Uh, no, actually, uh, squats are small water plane area, so, uh, twin hull. So that means uh, that the dummy hulls, uh, oh. water plane area will be comparatively lower than the catamarans. So uh, the factors are uh, uh, significantly different. And uh, you, you need to have a, a greater cross track strength for swats. But for catamarans, the, you will be having a larger haunch radius. So due to that reason, comparing to swat, it is more uh, robust. Hi, sir. Uh, my name is Arun. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. audible. Uh, so I am from the 43rd batch of Department of Technology. Yeah. It's the current third years. So I have a question for you. My question is, how did the recent IMO GHG emission regulations and IMO sulfur cap 2020 impact the design of SSCs? Uh, actually, this is um, uh, all these emissions are basically applied for unrestricted vessels. So this um, SSC crafts are principally um, coastal and near coastal vessels. And uh, in those cases, um, the applicability has to be decided based on uh, uh, the local port authority and the flag itself, because the vessel will be operating within the flag uh, uh, zones itself. But if it is uh, between two countries, then uh, it is to be complied. But if it is uh, completely restricted and within, within the uh, flag authority, um, uh, areas, then it has to be checked with flag and uh, usually, yeah, dealt case by case. Uh, so uh, what you're saying is it didn't actually impact much. It won't really impact much. Yeah, for for this uh, all these restricted vessels. So we'll be using some energy saving devices and that's all that we. Uh, the thing is, uh. uh uh, for example, if a vessel is operating in Australia, NSEV requirements will be the governing one. And um, in UK, it is small workbook code. I can't remember whether it has been um, updated, these requirements within that. But when you're doing a statutory, you, 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 from my mind, I could say that um, it is to be done case by case uh, based on the actual code, what it says. So if code is updated to cover this um, new requirements comes in, then obviously it has to comply. But so far, it is not. Thank you, sir. Uh, hi, Sujit. Uh, Sujit, this is uh, Sojan Anthony again. Okay. Uh, I got a very general question. Do you do this uh, longitudinal strength on all this, even on these tiny, uh, less, let's say, less than 24 meter vessels too? No. Do you have to? Because no. uh, does global strength really govern for these small vessels? I'll show you a table which I have shown. Where is it? Uh, no, no. Oh, yeah, here. Yep. So you can see a table here. Uh, for for ship rules, the cutoff length is um, when you are applying ship rule, a lot of rules and regulation for ship. The cutoff length is sixty-five meter because it is a very rob, rigid vessels. But for SSC, it is a lighter craft. So we decided that we go won't go up to 65, it is to be done a little length lower than uh, normal ship rule. So if it is a steel monohull, the cutoff length for longitudinal strength is 50 meter. And for uh, aluminum monohull, it is 45 meter. And for composite monohull, 40 meter. And similarly for multi-hulls, 40, 40, and 35. So these are the rule length cutoff where it determines longitudinal strength requirements. 
when you say cut off means okay if it is uh, if you are using ssc and the hull is steel and if it is greater than 50 meters you need to do the longitudinal strength exactly rule length if it is more than 50 meter you need to do longitudinal strength otherwise the strength is determined by the lock, local strength yeah i was wondering you know seeing uh, your rule covers uh, ribs and all yeah. for ribs and all with an open deck um, how can we really do a longitudinal strength huh? yeah 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 um one one general question about load shedding uh, yep. could you go back to that slide sure um yep so uh, could you could you explain to For, not for me for the general public what is a primary structure what is a secondary structure okay, i am so highlighting yeah. this because yeah yeah it's different in different rules that's true that's know? true that's true yeah. so um, <clears throat> uh, in in global strength of strength point of view whatever okay primary and secondary structure means those structures which are um, Uh, which are of primary nature for example uh, when you when you see hull as a whole the longitudinal bulkhead and transverse bulkheads are primary and uh, and small deep girders are secondary but for localized structures wherever your boundary condition is limiting for example if you take a panel panel contains three things plate stiffness and those ones limiting the boundaries so in this case you have a transverse member where your uh, uh, end conditions conditions are restricted and by reinforcing that so in those case those deeper members which limit your uh, secondary members boundary where this uh, reaction force is transmitted to the the member which is restrained in those case it is those are primary and those smaller members which takes the load directly are secondary so it is a it is a concept which we need to see based on uh, wh- where we are looking at yeah so all in simple terms all those small items are secondary and for larger items which which breaks the panels are primary members so those ones yeah, break the uh, panel uh, effective length are primary members now what i want to highlight is some other class societies differ, define primary structures and secondary structures the other way around mm. you know what you call secondary is called primary in some other class societies yeah depends on uh, the and then um, i that's one uh, that's one aspect i just wanted to highlight mm. the second thing is you mentioned 50% going to the primary is that just a thumb uh, thumb rule or is it something you have come up based on your research no i show you uh, let me open the software so this is the ssc software i'll give show you an example here site shell so we'll take a example of a site shell plate site shell stiffener and site shell web frames so site shell plate you can see that um, the stresses design stresses for at frame number we'll take 32 because 32 is common for stiffener and web yeah so frame number 32 the design pressure is 51.485 at the same location if you take longitudinal stiffener 80% of that that is 40.478 is the design pressure at the same location when you're using um, transverse web almost half so this is a load shedding theory this is a concept lr has used while writing this rules so 100% is taken by the plate and um, shredded 80% to the secondary members and 50% to the primary members is it the load that is 
it's yeah. just the design pressure that you are taking as exactly. 50%, exactly. not the load. The not loads the load. eventually get to the primary structure. Yeah. When you are, when we are applying the load as it is, what we do is that we do an FE analysis and apply the full pressure on the plate. And uh, yeah. yeah. So the statement that 50% is for the design pressure. Exactly. Not for the loads. Not for the loads. Because, because the fundamental is loads get from the plates yeah. to the second to your secondary from the secondary it goes to the primary, primary. so the eventually the load gets to the pri supposed to get to the primary yes but in a combination in in in, in an integrated panel uh, yeah. the rules consider this shedding uh, yeah. shares like yeah, yeah I, I was just catching on your uh, yeah. statement of load you know it's not 50 percent load it is yeah. the design pressure is 50 yeah, percent you know that's that's uh, that's an assumption, or that's that's, that's what you did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And and one question: uh, Where do you develop this software? In uh, London is, or in? It is in Southampton. It initially developed from London, and later we moved to Southampton University, and uh, uh -huh. the whole uh, technology group is based there. But now it is a is a we have a two technology centers. One is based in Southampton, and one is based in Busan. So there are software development people in both the areas. So they work in synchronizing. Where was the second one? Busan. Oh, Korea. Okay. Korea. Yeah. So our okay. global technology centers, these regions work together and come up with all these software updations and new softwares. Uh, thank you, sir. So, and we have one last question from Joshin. And it's, uh, hi, Sujit. Is there a situation where LR allows usage of the unwelded yielding stress? For aluminium, for example, molded frames, etc. Yep, that's a very good question, and uh, I have faced this uh, queries quite a lot from designers, especially from Australia. They use extrusions quite significantly, so extrusions are quite lighter than uh, normal plate panel concepts. So, if uh, extrusions are used without welding, uh, for instance, you're using uh, a complete panel extrusions from single mold and uh, connecting only at the boundary where it is to be restrained. And uh, we, we really see case by cases. So we apply uh, direct, in those kind of scenarios, I ended up doing finite element analysis and uh, we'll specifically study the stresses coming in the area where if that particular area where heavily stressed are unwelded for extrusion, then we accept that. We, we benchmark it against 0.2% unwelded stress. But if there are wells coming in that particular area, then obviously we need to select 0.2% pro stress in welded condition. Okay, thank you. I hope uh, the questions are finished and uh, Q&A section is over. Before that, I would like to again remind you if anyone else is there to uh, fill the feedback, feedback form, please do it. And that's it. We have now completed the Q&A section before the Actually, before the webinar, we all had a big idea on this matter, and uh, I'm now sure that we all get a solid understanding on this topic. It's hard for me to find a word to express how grateful we are right now. Now, I would like to share a token of gratitude for taking a sincere effort and for being there for us in your tight schedule. So uh, this is the at least we could uh, provide right now due to all this global pandemic. And the uh, uh, token of gratitude will be presented right now onto your screens. Thank you. And my pleasure. Thank you, sir. And uh, that's it. This, uh, this marks to the end of the first episode of SNAS webinar. And actually, it was very energetic, uh, I should say. And uh, it took a little more than we thought, and we should we should uh, note that and make the time arrangement according to that. And uh, I'm sorry, I my sincere apologies for all faculties and especially the speaker and all uh, other students. Uh, uh, and I think you all have enjoyed this uh, webinar. First of all, uh, on behalf of SNAS, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Mr. Sujit Tuneri for taking time from this valuable schedule and making this a simple but yet very informative webinar on this special topic. Thank you very much, sir. 
and I'm deeply thankful to uh, those stars, all the alumni, especially Anil Das sir and Vijay sir, uh, Vijay sir for helping us to conduct this webinar, and also Sojan sir for making this and um, very interactive section and uh, for uh, for bringing out the, all the in uh, curious minds in us. And I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Dr. A. Madhyarikan, head of the department, for being a constant inspiration and Anup sir, staff faculty advisor for being with us through all these NAS activities. Last but not the least, I would like to thank every faculties and students who put a sincere effort to attend the webinar and to make it a grand success. This is just our first episode. More is on the way and everyone, I'm sure everyone is going to enjoy it. And always free field to contact us and give us the always suggestions and feedbacks. It is really highly appreciated. Our first episode, our first episode of the webinar has been concluded now. And now you may all leave the meet. Please leave the meeting. Thank you. Have a great day.